Labour is on a mission to convince you they should be running the country after the next general election. Keir Starmer made his big pitch today, preaching to the converted or mission impossible. Tonight, question time comes from Cardiff. Labour has run the national devolved government here for over 20 years with a little bit of recent cooperation from Plaid Cymru and all the Westminster seats in the city are Labour too. We'll also be talking about whether Shamima Begum should have been allowed home to the UK to face justice. Are we right to change the words in books by authors like Roald Dahl? And can governments build roads and fight climate change at the same time? Welcome to Question Time. tonight from the UK government David TC Davis who served as the Secretary of State for Wales since Rishi Sunak became PM uh, back in October the MP for Monmouth who was a junior minister under Boris Johnson was once a keen amateur boxer fighting in several charity matches as a Tory tornado the leader of Plaid Cymru's four MPs at Westminster is Liz Savile Roberts. Plaid, or the Party of Wales, are committed to Welsh independence and also have 13 seats in the Senate, where they mostly work closely with Labour. She became the party's first ever female MP when she was elected in 2015. Thangam Debonair is UK Labour's shadow leader of the House of Commons. The MP for Bristol West was previously shadow for Brexit and then housing and has also written two books about domestic violence. She has one other string to her bow, being a trained classical cellist. The BAFTA winning actress and executive producer Reiki Iola was brought up just a few miles down the road from here. She's appeared in too many stage and TV productions to list, but most recently the drama Anthony, for which she won her BAFTA, and the BBC drama The Pact. And Anita Boating was once a producer on this programme. She then served three different cabinet ministers as a spin doctor, including for de facto Deputy Prime Minister David Livington. She's now a political commentator and partner at the lobbying and communications firm Portland. Good evening from Cardiff. Welcome to our panel. Welcome to our audience here, which reflects the electoral support for the parties here in Wales, because that's where we are this evening, of course. And welcome to you at home. And just to say, every Thursday, so Question Time is trending on social media. So take your pick. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you watch. Why not pitch in there and let's hear your point of view as well. OK, we'll take our first question now from Ross Cleland. One of Keir Starmer's five missions is to make us the fastest growing major economy. Political bluff? or economic reality. Right, so Keir Starmer unveiled these five missions. They are, as you say, the highest sustained growth in the G7 at the end of the first term, plus uh, there's uh, a pledge on fossil fuels, the NHS, the justice system, and education. So, the fastest growing major economy in the G7 in Labour's first term, Sangam. How would he do it? Ah. Can he do it? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I also think it, let's start with the fact it's good to have ambition. It's good to be He's ambitious to be able to for this deliver country. It, though. It's absolutely. I mean, Keir is a man of detail and vision. He likes to know exactly how we're going to do things before he says this is what we're going to do. So how does so it? Been think a he's lot do? of work. Well, first of all, we would have a different approach to running the economy. We would we have a, as part of that ambition that this should be economic growth sustained across all of our nations and regions, not just concentrated in small pockets of the South East and various other small parts of the United Kingdom. We know as well that investing in the renewable energy sector and the digital and tech industries of the future is going to be a critical part of how we grow our economy, how we become world beating in those industries, also how we tackle climate change and on some very basic levels, how we make our quality of life better. Now, if you had, if just to take one example of that, if you invest in renewables, you not only bring down people's bills, that would make us all better off, that helps with growing the economy. You create those great new jobs in those industries and insulating homes as well, we'd be doing that. Again, it brings down people's bills, but it also creates new jobs. you would be tackling climate change and you'd be helping with energy security. All of that taken as a whole is one example of how we would grow the economy. But, but hang, hang on a second. Way. I mean, apart from a, a period in the, in the mid-1990s, the UK has not beaten Germany for example, when it comes to sustainable growth, pretty much since World War II. And you can make this pledge, but then you, what you can't control is how much the other countries will grow. So how can somebody, you? Somebody's got to get the top. How can you promise to have the highest sustained growth? Why wouldn't we try? Why would well, we no, not aim try, for that? Why would we not aim for that? 
it, it is a mission, and I think a mission is a great thing for a political party to have. We have suffered for too long with a government that has low ambitions, low growth, low productivity. We've had that stagnating economy for 12 years now. When I first came into Parliament in 2015, the first debate I took part in was a debate about low productivity. Nothing has changed. We, if we had the same growth rate as we'd had under the last Labour government, every single one of us, every income would be 10,000, around about 10,000 pounds better off. That's the sort of economic growth you've got on the past under the Labour government in the UK, and that's what we're going to get in the future. I'm glad Keir is ambitious, because that's what this country okay. deserves. And David, so thank you for saying you're the party of low ambition. Well, well, first of all, we've actually had the third highest rate of growth in the G7 since 27. And don't forget, the G7 are the richest countries in the world. So the third highest is, is pretty good. What we had today uh, was, you know, I think we should congratulate Keir on his 11th relaunch, his second this year already. What we got from him was a whole load of unfunded spending commitments that would lead to higher taxes and borrowing. And, of course, we already know what Labour's attitude is to the economy and towards growth, because we've got a Labour government right here in Wales. Um, and their latest announcement last week was to say they're not going to build any more roads. No more roads for economic reasons. So no motorway um, bypasses, no more roads yes, bypasses you're, you're, from you're San You're boasting about the to... Conservative government's record, but the, as you know, the IMF <laughs> forecasts the UK to be the only G7 economy that's going to shrink this Yeah, year. but the IMF uh, uh, often make forecasts which are not correct. The, the reality is that all countries in the Western world are facing cha economic challenges but at the moment. But no, well, we, we're doing the worst. Well, we're doing a lot. We're doing all the things we're that... We're doing the worst uh, in the G7. Sort of, no, we, we have... Well, since 2010, if you want to take a short period of time, maybe if you want to take 2010 up until now, which is when the Conservative Conservatives have been in power one way or another. It's the third highest amongst the G7. And what we won't do is to cancel a road building project and say no more motorways because we need to have the infrastructure if our economy is going to grow. And that's what's happening in Wales. No road building, higher taxes, and a government that spent £150 million building a road that didn't, uh, or, or developing plans for a road that didn't get built. Over £200 million on the airport down the road there at Cardiff, this which has got no flame, a long planes way from flying the UK out. Economy it's absolutely no, I because, might because this is, Keir Starmer has said that Welsh Labour provides the blueprint for what the Labour government are going to do in Westminster. The blueprint is right here no okay. road building, millions being wasted on, on airports with no fl planes flying out of them. Congestion charging is going to be next on the roads of Wales. This is what is happening at the moment right now under a Labour government in Wales. All right, let's hear from... There's lots of hands up, so where shall I start? Yes, uh, the man there at the back with the glasses. <coughs> this question is really for Mr Davis and for Plaid Cymru and for Thangham. At the moment, the Conservative government are, are potentially going to destroy the semiconductor industry in South Wales. They've unnecessarily put 600 jobs at risk in Newport. Um, the Conservative government, what's really worrying with the Conservative government is they don't really understand semiconductors. For example, Mr Davis, I believe you commented that 200 people worked at the plant. There are 600. 600 people working in Newport. Mr Sharp said, we don't make fab and we don't make wafer anymore. He doesn't know the difference between the fabrication um, of the wafer, the factory they made in, which that is an abbreviation for, and what we actually do. In Newport, the fab is where they make the wafers. The wafers are what... The... Just in case not everyone at home is familiar with what you mean by wafers. A, a wafer is a, is a flat disc that um, micro, uh, microchips are made of. In Newport, we make very simple switches. Mr Sharps didn't know. His comment was, I believe, we, now make, we don't make fab, we make wafers. The fab is where we make it. Um, the wafers are what we build the microchips on. It's very, very disturbing that microelectronics is what's going to drive economic growth. Um, the other countries are investing tens and hundreds of billions in microelectronics. Um, in Europe, I believe Germany, 43 billion. America, 53 billion. Asia, 300 billion. The Conservative Party, Mr Davis, has not even got any plan. Your industrial strategy for the semiconductor industry has not been published. Therefore, okay. I would put... Let, why, I don't we, let, let, yeah. why don't we let him briefly answer before I come sir, around the rest sir, of first okay. of all, sir, first of all, you know perfectly well, and, and it might hurt you to remember this, it was actually Labour MPs, local Labour MPs, that called for an inquiry into, into what was going on, into the Chinese ownership of next year. It was, sir. It was also the unions that called for it, and they kept demanding that the government do something about it. The government did hold that inquiry. 
I was briefed by the security services about it. They, the, the government hang on, could hang not on, inquire. But, but, no, what what, what not... the man there is talking about is a Sorry. lack of investment. No, a think, lack of I knowledge of the, the industry and a lack of investment. Is a Chinese purchase of next period. No, he's not. He's shaking his head. He's talking about lack of investment. Do you want to address that question for me? Well, as far as the semiconductor cluster is concerned, the catapult was put together as part of the Cardiff Capital Region growth deal, which is 50% funded by the UK government. Well, Mr Davis, <coughs> the cluster is nothing without the Newport facility. Yeah. You're yeah. swerving the question. Exactly. I'm not on about what the What is divest, the question, sir? I am not talking about divestment. I'm talking about the 600 <laughs> jobs the Conservative Party have put at risk. And you've, they, In what way, sir? They, they, what, what support have you got for the people? The, unfortunately and unhelpfully, the Tory government, uh, the, the Tory MPs, including yourself, Mr Davis, you've been invited to the site. I've been Labour the have been there, Plaid Cymru have been there. I've you, been there twice. Okay. You, 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 what, you have I, constituents think, in your... I've been there twice, sir. I tell you what I'll do. I th uh, I've not been that there I'm, twice. Not I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to shut you down because okay. you made a very valid point, but what I'm going to let the other people come in if you don't mind, if no that's problem. OK. Yeah, and, and I think Liz. the major point for Newport is the fact that there is this major China ownership within Nexperia, the company that owns this, has been used as a red herring away from the fact that we need this development and, and, and the, the way for fab, the Newport way for fab fabrication, the factory, which is the largest of its type in the United Kingdom, is essential to that cluster. And to speak frankly, if we were talking about the structural inequalities of the United Kingdom, it is entirely impossible to believe that that sort of facility, if it were in the south-east of England, would have been to allowed to die on its feet. It's, that's what's been happening in Wales, and that is what is intolerable here. We need those jobs, but we actually need them in real time. These are not ambitions for the future. And, and in Where terms we have of... something now, we should be making sure that okay. if there's a problem with the ownership, that we keep those skills and we keep those, those, those jobs in a place like... And in terms really of the, the question that we heard originally, which is about Keir Starmer's five missions, political bluff or well, economic reality? Rishi Sunak also made five similar mission statements. So this is a real echo to this. And again, talking about Newport, if we're, looking, we're here in Wales tonight, we're here in Cardiff... Labour actually has been a charge effectively in Wales, represented in Westminster and then in Cardiff for over 100 years. What structurally about the United Kingdom has served Wales well in that time? And what disappoints me, having seen Gordon Brown's constitutional work and uh, his report on the, on the Constitution, is it's always more of the same. There must be a radical rethinking about how government and how the structure of the UK operates in order to bring not just Wales and Scotland, but many regions of England out of the over-centralised dead hand that's, of control from that's Westminster. That's exactly okay. All right. what, what was England. I want to hear more from the audience. Forgive me. That's exactly what was in the report. Woman with the blonde hair. I think it's bizarre to hear the Conservative Minister complain that we've had 11 relaunches under Labour when we've had three Conservative Prime Ministers exactly. in just the past six months. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, Labour may have had 11 relaunches, but Keir Starmer has been a much longer term leader who, frankly, appears a lot more trustworthy and stable. OK. I'm with a glass of the bank. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, regarding Keir Starmer's statement today, if his statement was an essay for a degree, all we'd have is a page of contents. <laughs> I'm concerned that you're going to win the next election because people don't want to vote Tory. I understand that you don't want to give your manifesto out until the run-up to the election, but we need to start hearing facts in detail. There, there was play I appreciate that, and I think that's why Keir chose now, which is hopefully not too far off from the general election, but enough for a give us time to be able to explain the detail. There is plenty of detail in the mission statement. But there's very little and then, detail, and, actually, and, hanging in the mission statement. And they're going statement. to be followed by five further separate specific announcements, focused each one on a different mission. So we're going to have the economic one first. There will then be more work and announcements on the health one. But we already okay. know a lot of what's going to be in it. And I can talk at, at quite some length about please some don't. of the detail. No, and no, please don't. Told me I won't. No, only but it is get around important the rest of the that we have the detail. And the detail does exist. Ricky. Um, I was interested in, in the use of the word mission. I think you've maybe said it, Fangham, four or five, maybe six times. I was at home listening to Keir Starmer's speech thinking that uh, there could be a sort of drinking game um, going forwards. Every time you hear a Labour MP use the word mission, you get to swig your favourite tipple because that's, that's the word of choice. And it made me think of, of Buzz Lightyear. Um, and it's admirable. And he didn't, he didn't say anything that I don't agree with in terms of ambition and a mission, but a bit like me waking up every day and thinking, right, today is the day that I run that far and vacuum the house from top to bottom and do X and Y and Z and, uh, and three hours later I'm still in bed 
or something else has come in that's knocked me off course. I never understand how these missions can happen in real time, in the real world, because of the things people have mentioned, because other things happen. Um, so it's great to, to have ambition, we all should. But in reality, uh, you have to bear in mind that there are factors that will be coming yes, will. at these missions and it, from it's, every it's direction. It's exactly because there will be factors coming at us from all directions that it's important that Keo has set out a clear sense of mission because politicians have to have a direction. At the moment, we have a government that's okay. swayed off course ten times in one day and we need to know that we are heading in this particular direction because headwinds will buffet the okay. ship and we need to know which way we're pointing and I think that's what Keir has done today. I, I think Thangham has had a lot of time to set out her case for why Keir Starmer's five missions, which obviously weren't based on responding to the fact that um, Rishi Sunak has five pledges. And so far, we've heard that Keir Starmer is a man of great detail we haven't heard the detail I, I and the reality no, but the, the, the reality of the pledge is that i always judge these things based on would anyone reasonable disagree with them no we want to grow more of course we do we want Great. to tackle crime and education so what matters and what matters for trust in politics is that we hear about how and I, what we I, haven't I got and what we haven't got no, no, hang on, hang on. You, in fairness i've given you a long time a long time to, to provide about. any any examples of, the, of how we're going to get to the levels of growth that will see us become the fastest growing country in the g7 and short of going over and throwing rocks at other countries in the g7 i can't see how we get there and what we've got right now is a lot of language that obviously no one would disagree with but what we don't have is a real tangible plan everyone in this room wants growth but what we haven't seen is some of the tough choices and a real acknowledgement that there are going to need to be tough choices to deliver the kinds of growth that we really need in this country okay. i'm going to try and get these more questions just like a couple more points in the audience yes this woman here Please don't overpromise and underdeliver and exactly. be Absolutely. realistic. I agree. All right, and let, me I take, agree. let me take one more point from the back. Yes, the woman in the white top with her hand up at the back, and the, or and the orange, oh, sorry. orange top too. Um, going back to your opening statement, David, um, I think here could do a lot worse as using Welsh Labour policies as a blueprint. Um, I think it's quite lazy just to dismiss policies. Um, as untrue. Okay. It's not true that there are no planes leaving Cardiff Airport and it's not true that Wales, uh, Welsh Government are denying any future road building. They've just upped the criteria. So that's what? just not yeah, true to say that. Okay. 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 Well, okay. I'm going to... That in a minute, I, we may come to that and you may have your chance. So I'm just going to move on because there's quite a few questions I want to get through dictated by you, of course. We choose our questions based on where your interest lies. Before I move on, I want to tell you quickly that Question Time is in Sunderland next week. Week after that, we're in London, so if you'd like to come to either show, go to the uh, website. The address is here. You follow the instructions there and you can come and be part of our audience and let us know what you think. Right, let's get to another question. From Dr Marcus Andrews. Is Shamima Begum truly a threat to UK security? So, of course, Shamima Begum has just lost her legal challenge. Uh, and so she is still in uh, a camp in northern Syria and is barred from returning to the UK. Is she truly a threat to UK security, David? That's the view of the courts and the, the security services certainly think so. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to side with the security services on that issue and not with, um, frankly, some uh, left-wing campaigning lawyers. And does it trouble you that she was... She was a child when she made this choice. Well, it, it troubles me that, uh, that people went out to Syria and committed atrocities. I don't, wh whether she did or not, I don't. It troubles me that some people may try to come back and commit atrocities over here. Um, and what I'm pleased about is that the UK government is going to put the safety of the British people first. Liz? I think this sets a, a very difficult and dangerous precedent because effectively what we've said here is that those citizens of the United Kingdom who only hold one citizenship and were born here are entitled to maintain that citizenship. But those citizens who hold dual citizenships are not. Because, of course, what's happened here with Shamima Bigham is, is that she has, uh, I understand, a Bangladesh um, citizenship. Well, no, she doesn't, actually. But, but she, so she they, could They, possibly, have, they yeah. haven't said that they will accept her. They, they've said that they at won't accept her. At the moment, she has her. no citizenship So she is, she at is all. presently in limbo. Now, to take a step back from the, the domestic politics and the way this has been politicised rather than being treated as a legal issue, let us look at the United States. And it is within the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States, the United States that if you are born in the United States, you have citizenship for life unless you renounce it. 
So in all the circumstances, then we look at a, a young woman, underage, a child-in-law, trafficked out there, now being flaunted by right-wing politicians as something as a as a populist cause, and actually right riding driving a coach and horses in setting precedent for law in future. This is immensely concerning. None of us like what she did. And would you, that, do you want her to come back? I want the law to make sure that it safeguards citizens without fear or favour. And in this instance, I think this, the law has been used in such a way by this government whereby there will be citizens in the future, if you think of Jewish citizens who hold Israeli citizenship, others who hold dual citizenship, who may well find that this government or a government in future can use this law against them again. So it's always follow the precedent and fear that in this case. OK, man here in the Tartan Waistcoat. Well, she just said exactly what I was going to say, cos um, my parents obviously came over here, Windrush, from the Caribbean. I was born here, so does that mean if I do something wrong now, even though I've never lived in the Caribbean, are you going to then send me back to the Caribbean? I think yeah. most of us agree what she done or allegedly done was like, totally wrong. But she was born in the UK, she was raised in the UK, she was educated in the UK, and she was probably let down in the UK, because at the end of the day, she was a child. I worked in children's services, and a child is always a child. No excuses. So I agree with you. And so do you think she should be brought back here? Yeah, she's, um, unfortunately, she's our problem, if you want to put it that way, and then we should deal with her. We shouldn't be saying um, Bangladesh should have her, or I think her husband was, was married or lived in Holland. Yeah, then Holland, is, Holland ain't going to take her. Bangladesh are not going to take her. Why should they? Mm. OK. Man here in the maroon sweater. Uh, would it not be easier to monitor her um, if she's back in the UK? Someone so radicalised, surely the security services could keep a, a much closer handle on her if she was back in the UK. Okay. She's, in, she's in Syria now. We don't know what she's doing. So, Anita, it's interesting, this, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's been a, a, a topic of much discussion. And also, when you look at other countries, for example, you were mentioning, Liz, the US. The, U the US has... Anyone who travelled to Syria to, to join and fight for Islamic mm. State has been able to come back to the US. A number of other countries have done it. Australia, uh, France are taking women and children back, for example. Do you agree with the decision that's been made about Shamima Begum? I think that the first duty of any government is to keep people safe. And I don't envy the Home Secretary who had to take an enormously difficult decision weighing up the rights of British citizens to be kept safe um, and the, the clear, we don't know the evidence, but some, some clearly some evidence that the courts and security services were aware of that she would pose a threat. And I think that had that decision gone the wrong way and there was some kind of threat in the UK, the burden of the responsibility that he, that he um, Sajid Javid at the time, would have felt would have been enormous. So I think these are very serious and finely balanced issues. I also think being a citizen is not just a question of rights. It is also a question of responsibility. And we have seen clear instances, I think, from Shamima's behaviour that we know of that indicates that she is not behaving in the way that one would hope a citizen would. And I think there are instances where it is the right thing to do to take citizenship away when people have dual citizenship or acquired British citizenship. But the difficulty here, as Liz says, is because she has this possible other citizenship, not as a result of her, but because her parents are of, of another um, origin. They're from... They're Bangladeshi. And so I think that becomes a little more difficult. It's a finely balanced thing, but I have a lot of sympathy with people who feel concerned because the reality is that we've got to have a system where citizens are equal. <laughs> and, and part of that means that certain citizens that don't have um, heritage somewhere else or um, a relation somewhere else wouldn't have this be a consequence. It's nevertheless clear that she does pose a threat, and I think I, on balance, side with the court. Sorry, that wasn't a very coherent answer, but I really think that it's a finely balanced thing, and it seems that the question was really about risk, and she did pose a risk to the UK. OK. The man there in the, in the middle, in the grey jacket. I, I'm not sure how can she pose a threat to the security of the United Kingdom. I mean, this girl was smuggled when she was 15. She was uh, then helped to... Uh, to travel from Turkey to Syria by an operative to the Canadian <laughs> intelligence. Yeah. And I assume that the British intelligence and the Canadian intelligence, they have like connections between each other. Now, um, nobody uh, protected this 15-year-old from doing harm to herself and to her uh, homeland, which is Britain. 
And I mean, I'm proud to be British, and I'm not sure I can see that she can pose threat. If she's committed a crime, get her back here. Let her be tried in a court of yeah. law. Yeah. I think this exactly. is what British, Britain does best. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Law, the rule of law. Yeah. Not to, to strip her out of her citizenship. She's never seen Bangladesh. She's never known another country, really, mm -hmm. for her to be punished by this. Uh, of course, she might have committed mm -hmm. uh, crimes that we... Uh, I mean, I'm an Iraqi by origin, mm -hmm. and ISIS committed horrible crimes uh, in the country I came from. Mm -hmm. um, and I do appreciate what ISIS can do to other countries. Okay. Thank you. Would you share that view? So Actually, she's, she's, she's British at the end of the day. She should come home and face justice here. In a democracy with the rule of law, we have a separation of powers between the politicians and the, ju and the judiciary. And we set the laws in Parliament. We won't necessarily agree. David and I will disagree about many things. And, but when it comes to a separation of powers, it means it's important that the judiciary weighs up the evidence, the courts have weighed up the evidence. Yeah, but we hang don't on, know the what original decision is. was taken by Sajid Javid, the then Secretary in 2019. And, and, then and we... the Appeal Commission was saying, was he right to take that decision? But and it was originally a political decision. And then the courts assessed that. They seen the evidence. They are applying the rules of law that we in Parliament have set, not necessarily me personally. And if her lawyers, which I understand they are going to, feel that that law has been improperly applied, they have, in a democracy with the rule of law, the right of appeal. And I think that's important. I think when politicians weigh in, telling the judiciary, telling the legal system that they've got it wrong, when we set the laws, that's deeply unhelpful. I think we have a system with the rule of law whereby um, people, private citizens, with a lawyer, and I think casting aspersions on the lawyers is deeply unhelpful, mm. have the right to have their rights upheld. And, and that is where we stand at the moment. We are still probably in a process, because as I understand it, her lawyers have said that they will be looking at an appeal, which they are entitled okay. to do. Ricky? Um, I think the, the appeal was to, was to assess if the government had, had acted legally and they decided that they had. I don't know... But they also said that they felt there was something to be looked at um, in terms of her having been trafficked. I think if somebody, if somebody is filmed by 100 people um, committing a terrible crime and they're caught with a weapon in their hand covered in blood, and it's obvious that they did it, <laughs> they still get the chance to have their time in court. Mm -hmm. They still get the chance to stand there and, and state their case, even when we know it was them, even when we don't like what, we, what they did. We don't decide, 100 people saw you do it, so off you go. Um, I think she should absolutely have been able to come back here and be tried for the crimes she is said to have committed. That means the government have taken her, her citizenship away. Um, but instead, the government decided to make an example of her and they have done that most successfully. All right. I'll take one point before I move on. Yes, the man here in the blue shirt. Yeah, well, I don't think it's anything to do with uh, risk or being tried here. She's she just being used as a political football at the moment for yeah. the, um, the Tory party. Absolutely. Well, I mean, Keir Starmer has said uh, he doesn't think she should come back either. Yeah, but so but a cro no, a So there is cross-party agreement. It's nothing to do with the Conservative it's, it's party. It's, there's a cross-party view about it's, this. It's, it's the Tory party who, who actually uh, went out uh, there in the first place. But supported by Labour, I think, on this issue, are we not, Thangham? I just said I think that we have to respect what the courts have done. If, okay. a, if the law has been a improperly rare applied, breakout of she agreement. has the right to appeal, and I think that's important that we okay. notice that in the rule of law. It doesn't happen that often, but you've actually got both politicians agreeing here. Let's take another question. Let's move on. Uh, Jenny Bevan, where are you? Does the panel think that the rewriting of Royal Dahl books is an opportunity for the discussion of social change or is censorship through the back door? So never let it be said we don't cover all topics here on <laughs> Question Time. Um, what do you think, Jenny? Um, I hope it's going to open a discussion on social change, but I'm worried where it's going to stop the rewriting of classics and popular culture. OK. Books. Well, look, shall I just give you some examples 
of, of what's been changed, just so we know what we're dealing with here. So these are, these are Roald Dahl's books, obviously children's books. Um, so some of the words that have been taken out uh, by the, the uh, publisher Puffin, which says it has a significant responsibility to young readers who are beginning to read independently. So, for example, um, a child that described as fat is now called, it describes as enormous. Mrs Twits, you know, from the Twits, no longer ugly and beastly, just beastly. Uh, the words crazy and mad have been removed, for example. Then you've got the BFG. The BFG's coat is no longer black. Uh, and Mary in the BFG now goes as still as a statue instead of white as a sheet. There are other things, for example, a weird African language spoken by monkeys is no longer described as weird. Reiki, what do you think? Uh, well, um, first of all, I should say that, that I, I prefer my Roald Dahl um, um, filtered through other people's imagination, so I like the... Yeah. The stage versions, I like the films. Um, I can't remember the last time I picked up the books. Uh, they don't appeal to me or my or my girls. But um, things like this, I always think if, if the books were selling well, would they really have done this? Mm -hmm. If they thought they were going to lose money, would they have done this? Presumably they found a demographic that they can't access uh, and they've decided the way to bring them in is to say, hey, look, you know, you this won't offend your... Your child, this won't offend. It, this won't be difficult to read. It won't offend you to read it, and that's great. And I applaud that. Now, if anything, this is a case of um, the dangers of being too kind, right? Uh, but so there's that. I think. I think there must be some monetary value to this decision. Otherwise, it makes no mm -hmm. sense. Maybe the fact that we're even talking about it now, perhaps all publicity is good, right? So. <laughs> and what do you think about things like? not using terms like black and white as descriptors anymore. So, for example, going still as a statue instead of white as a sheet. Well, do you know what? I think if they... In, 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 just for the fairness of it, I suppose, if people are using... So these are words... They've taken out words which you would hear pre-Watershed. That's the thing, isn't it? That they're, they're words that children could use. And if somebody... Who knows? Maybe somebody involved with the publishers felt that their child is having certain words thrown at them as insults. They're being bullied by certain words and they go, you know what, I don't want my kid to hear that word, which is then in a book that I sell. I, and all the time I'm trying to think, what's the point of this? Why did they bother doing this? Yeah. Why the need to do it? Do you it? think they shouldn't have bothered? Well, no, no, not at all. I think it's great that they did, but I don't think it's the benevolent okay. decision. Can I just say one other thing? That uh, some of the people who've been most vocal about this decision have said nothing at all about the hundreds of books whole books that have actually been banned, right? People who've been really, really vocal about this have said nothing at all about, in the US, and they've been, uh, they've been writing in American publications and British publications, and I think, how interesting that you've, you've made this um, an issue to talk about, and at the same time, because of the people who've made the decision, and presumably uh, the politics that they follow, you've decided not to mention at all Books like, like um, Charlotte's Web, right? Children's books that are harmless have been completely removed from schools and libraries in the US, but for some reason, the odd word change means that we're headed towards a, a communist state. OK. David. Social change or censorship through the back Well, door? I think you can have both. I don't see why you can't have a discussion about social change that's appropriate to children of all ages, but why bother changing these words? Um, I, I think I, the only two I think I remember reading and reading to my kids were James and the Giant Peach and, the, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and I think it read somewhere that Augustus Gloop couldn't be described as fat. I may, may have... May no, that, that's something. apparently nice. Oh, you described as enormous but instead of fat. Instead, I mean, you know, what, what is the point of all this? I, I think Reiki may have a point, actually. I wonder if some of the publicists for these book companies are laughing uh, their socks off at the thought of, of selling more and getting loads of free publicity for it. But I think, really, what, what I would say is what really worries me a lot more than anything I saw in those books are some of the misogynistic words which I've heard in a lot of the music which children... Uh, my children and, and, and children listen to at the moment. So, by all means, I suppose, have a discussion about whether Augustus Gloop should be fat or enormous, but it's pretty trivial compared to the absolutely appalling words, which I couldn't even use, in songs which I think are quite mainstream on the radio at the moment. So let's have a discussion about some of them as well and the impact on women's lives those words are having. OK. Man here in the front. Hi. Uh, I'm not sure about censorship through the back door. I'd say it's blatant and egregious um, polarisation and censorship, quite frankly. Um, I, I, I share a similar characteristic as August Gluck insofar as I'm being known to be fat, quite frankly. I'd much rather be called fat than enormous, so I don't quite know what the sense of reviews are thinking there. <laughs> OK. 
<laughs> the woman behind you in the headscarf, yeah. Um, I would like to know why Steinbeck's books are still taught in school, uh, with the language they have in it, it has in it. Um, my family are from uh, Sierra Leone and Cape Town, and um, I was born here, but I would like to know why those books are still accepted in school and taught in school, well, because with the language they have in them. What, in Mice and men. In terms of unacceptable terms for black people, that's yeah, what you're referring absolutely. to, isn't it? Yeah. Right, OK. I think the time has come now in, for those books not to be taught. OK. Liz? I think the fact that we're having a, a discussion about social changes is something actually that we should do with the texts that came from those times. Um, so when you, when you same... hear authors saying, so for example, you've got, I don't know, Anthony Horowitz, for example, F Philip Pullman, uh, or Anthony Horowitz particularly, Salman Rushdie, uh, mm. saying, you know, this, this is an outrage, it shouldn't be happening. Well, I mean, it, it, we, we use texts from their time. That is where they, that's where they came from. What we now do as a society as we move ahead is that we look at those texts, we can enjoy them in certain ways and we can also criticise them in certain ways. But I think actually the fundamental point which probably the publishers are using as they monetize the nostalgia that is Roald Dahl for many parents, actually is that, oh, we're not, we're not going to be accused of being, of driving bullying for children. Now, bullying for children will continue and we have to tackle that from day to day and in different ways. But I think that how we use text and how we use text intelligently to look at how social mores have changed is really, really important because those, they're, they're primary evidence, if you like, from their time. And actually one of the things that it is really important that we look at how things have changed and what was tolerable then and is not tolerable now. So should and we, we be actually doing look what, Philip... what, we, what we shouldn't be tolerating now so should we be if we doing put what, ourselves in the history what books? What Philip Pullman is suggesting is it's saying rather than change, it's just let them go out of print. Well, I think that the, the readers, children, their parents, schools are very able to select. Maybe John Steinbeck will be deselected. We've already deselected many in the past. That's how it goes. But we, the texts themselves are pieces of their time. And so we they should shouldn't change. So the yep. words to Royal Dahl's book shouldn't change. That's what you're saying. Yep. OK. The man there in the red um, sleeveless top. My understanding just is that, um, whether a coincidence or not, is that the Royal Dahl estate is about to or selling the rights to the whole Roald Dahl series to Netflix um, to further add information. Right, OK, so you, what, in, in terms of Ricky's commercial point, is that why you're yes, saying that? Yes, in terms of the commercial point, it is, sh okay. I have my understanding. OK, and the man next to you. Uh, I think uh, social change is great, but uh, censoring books and changing <laughs> words and banning books as well is very dangerous, because, mm. uh, uh, like the lady on the left said, like, it's good to look back on the books and see what was bad about them and criticise them, but changing them in any way and banning them, I think, is very, very dangerous. So let me... So, cos this is not... And we're, we're concentrating on Roald Dahl, but he's not the only writer to have had his, his works amended, but his works have been amended before. So let me just run this past you. So the, the original 1964 version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, for example, the Oompa Loompas, I don't know if you remember them, but the little characters, they were, they were described as being from a pygmy tribe imported from the deepest and darkest part of the African jungle. That's how it was written in 1964. And then in the end, Dahl came under a lot of pressure from his publishers. Later on, he agreed to change it, uh, particularly for when it went on screen, and they, in the end, that was dropped, and they were just the Oompa Loompas from Loompa land. So would you be happy for it to have remained as is? I can't really say whether I would be happy or not, but it's... Uh... Uh, it is quite bad what he said in the beginning, but um, like like you were saying, it's good to criticise it. If that came out in print, then you're like, oh yes, then this is quite bad. But but don't change yeah. it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, don't change it. Like okay. keep it how the author wanted it. Anita, I I think that that is different and interesting because the author made the decision. Maybe well, he under didn't some, love it. Yeah, under some duress, I think. Maybe in the he, end. he didn't love it. But the idea of books coming out with an author's name on it, not recognising the fact that uh, someone somewhere has actually changed them without any consultation, or that's where I think there is a, a serious challenge. I think we all know now that we could stand to improve our critical thinking, our ability to look at information and go, is that true? Does that sound right? Our ability to watch a TikTok video and go, just just because someone said this is what's happening, is it actually true? And I think these are skills we absolutely need to make sure our children have too. Um, and whether they're in books of literary note or they're on a tweet that we saw last week, we need to be able to look at something and assess 
why it was written and what its purpose is and what context we need to be aware of. And that's what we can do with these books. We can look at them and say, why is it that someone is described as ugly and is that's considered to be a bad thing in a book? Is that the right thing? And it's a really good prompt for a conversation. So I think this is ridiculous. I think it's actually quite outrageous and I think it genuinely harms our society if we cannot look at things that we disagree with and we're not able to properly analyse and understand and have conversations, polite conversations, about where they're wrong and how things have changed. OK. Man here in the front, then. Just a bit further over, yeah. I just think the underlying point here is that these books are for children. Exactly. And just to piggyback on what the minister was saying, I feel like that this is no different to the kinds of songs that um, teenagers and even younger than that are being exposed to today. Running around with, you know, guns and knives and, and, and doing drugs and committing crimes. It's no different to, um, you know, these, these books... Well, I suppose that we're talking about language here, right? And I think that these, these songs definitely need to be addressed as well as uh, like okay. the Roald Dahl books. All right, oh. let me hear from the woman there in the scarf. Sorry, Ricky, I'll come back to you. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the selling of his books have just shown its success. I mean, it's sold over 250 million um, copies of his um, children's books, translated into dozens of languages. So surely that shows the success of the original wording um, that, you know, I grew up with these books. And you think they shouldn't change? Absolutely not, no. no. OK. Hang on. I think it's important to notice some of the things that are going on here in this discussion. So the question was about, is it, is it a discussion of social change or censorship through the back door? We are having the discussion self-evidently right here. Is it the back door? Seems to me it's the front door. But I think the fact that it was Salman Rushdie in particular, this really strikes me, because let's not forget what's happened to Salman Rushdie when people tried to ban his yeah. words. He nearly died last year. He has lost the sight of one eye and the use of one arm. He is one of the most gifted writers of our times. You may or may not like what he wrote and how he wrote about it, but it's important that we allow him to write his books. And it's if someone tries to change the words, it's not by him anymore. The same goes for Roald Dahl. I think to change the words means it's no longer Roald Dahl's work. I would prefer that we educate our children and each other and encourage mm. each other to use our critical faculties and make an assessment for ourselves. But threatening people, as happened to, to Salman Rushdie, I mean, it can't happen to Roald Dahl because he's no longer with us, but deciding who gets to decide what are good words and bad words is really problematic for me. And I think we have to think very carefully about where the implications of this go. And Salman Rushdie's experience is a very salutary warning to us. OK, Ricky, very briefly. <laughs> To say, I mean, I agree, I don't think at all that we should be censoring books. I think it's difficult with Roald Dahl because you have often the author's voice. The author's voice is telling you that this person is fat and ugly. So if you're reading that to your five-year-old, you have to challenge the author. You're not saying that nasty person said something nasty about that... That nasty character says something about that character. You're having to challenge the author's voice and it's really hard when you're reading to a small child you should if you try it you'll see how difficult it is in the middle of a book at bedtime to go the person who wrote this book is talking rubbish then and we won't use that word and then carry on it's actually really hard but i don't think you need to change it maybe you just don't buy them buy a different book, book. Yes. all right yes. now let's come to a subject that was brought up already we touched on it briefly and it's a bit of a hot topic here in wales so let's hear from lynn davis how much will the Welsh Government's decision to scrap all major road projects damage the Welsh economy? Right, so for those who aren't aware, everyone in this room will be more than aware, but for those who aren't, um, 44 major road building projects in Wales have been scrapped by the Government here over concerns about their environmental impact, including and this has touched a bit of a nerve for many, a third bridge across the Menai Strait. There are other road projects that are going to go ahead, but there's a lot that aren't. Liz. I have is that the right a, decision? Well, I have a road project in my own constituency which is not going ahead. And forgive me for the moment, the local moment, but I have to describe it. It's a former RAF airbase that is now owned by Welsh Government. Duval Merionydd is highly dependent on tourism, which is great, but we desperately need other economic investment. I repeat, Welsh Government own this site. You can't get to it with an articulated lorry because it has to go over a Grade 2 listed bridge and then turn sharp right angles. 
That same village also has traffic coming down with tourism from Liverpool and Manchester every summer, which blocks it up and people have been injured on the road. We applied to Welsh Government for a bypass that actually was an access to that airfield. We were refused. We were apply applied through levelling up to uh, UK Government as well and were refused again. Now, it seems to me, of course, we're going to make these changes. Of course, we're going to reduce the number of roads that we need to build in future. But we need roads in certain places, just as we, we will need coal for the while, for steel, for turbines. And to make this an announcement, and the announcement on, on, on the, on, in Clambedder and my constituency was made in the first week of COP26 it, by, by Lee Waters, the Transport Minister. And it felt at the time as to be purely a political announcement that was convenient in a distant... Uh, not Labour constituency in a far corner of Wales. At the same time, as the announcement was made recently over the roads, there was also an announcement to make that the bus grant wouldn't continue, which has directly affected the number of rural buses. Now, there is a broad brush approach to politics, and many of us will buy into that. But when you don't actually, when you're in government, don't put that into effect on the ground, and you penalise local communities, which happen to be distant and remote to you, when you see the head to the valleys road going ahead, that will inevitably cre create friction and create a sense of inequality. So, Thangam, this is um, a Labour decision, obviously. The Welsh Government is Labour. Uh, you support it, presumably? Well, I think the thing about devolution is that you are devolving powers closer to the people who are going to take the impact of those decisions. So I think that's and you Welsh softening us up for saying you don't agree, but nonetheless, no, I think it's, it's up to them. It's a way of saying that, you know, devolve, devolution means what it says, and we have to, do, we have to trust in the process. OK, now, well, the it, question I, is, is the decision to scrap all major road problems, will it damage well, the Welsh economy? And I what think, do you think? Well, I think you already said it wasn't all major roads, and I think that's... Well, the first 40, OK, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. 59 new projects were put on hold in 2021, so this review could take place. Only 15 are going ahead, and they're slightly smaller than they were. So maybe not all, but pretty damn near all. Well, Will it damage the Welsh economy? It's not all, so I need to be clear about that. And I think there's lots of different ways of looking at how an economy runs. It is important that we have connectivity. It's important that we have transport links. It's also important that we breathe clean air and that we tackle climate change. These things will mean difficult decisions. And, and I am absolutely sure that the people of Wales, as you are showing, will be scrutinising the decisions of the Welsh Government, telling them if you're not happy with it. But also, I've heard this evening from some people in the audience, I can't remember someone who said earlier, that actually it is, it is important that we're clear about the facts. This is not cancelling all roads. It may be that you disagree with some of the decisions. Well, we haven't even got but a train link between North and South democracy. Wales within Wales. And, and in a democracy, you get to hold the government to account. You get to say if you disagree. So is your and answer... Also, so, well, hang on, thank you. Is your answer yes or no, then? The decision to scrap all major road projects... Uh, did I miss well, it? I'm, I'm, well, um, because, because will it, I'm, will it not damage the Welsh I'm rejecting the think? premise of the question because the decision oh, wasn't to scrap all roads. We've, we've just established no, that. Oh, the question was to scrap all major road Well, I think projects. you also said it isn't scrapping all major road projects, so I'm, not, I'm rejecting the premise of the question. <laughs> no, no, you hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You don't get to do that on question time. You have to actually yeah, answer. You may not like how it's framed, but that is the question. Will it or will it not damage the Welsh economy? I don't know if it will damage okay. the Welsh economy. OK, I know. Well, fair enough. You don't necessarily have to have all the answers. No, that... Sounds like an honest answer to me. Right, the man in the grey sweater there with the blue shirt, yes. Um, this just made an interesting point. We don't have any real um, transport between South and North Wales. Uh, perhaps Mr Davis could explain to us, as the Secretary of State for Wales, why HS2 is considered an England and Wales project, even though not a single centimetre of that track will be built here. Scotland and Northern Ireland are receiving subsidies in lieu of the uh, HS2 funding. Why are we not getting over five billion? We could build those rails then. Well, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question, sir, definitely, and then I want to come back to the roads, because as, as far as HS2 is concerned, it is going to improve uh, the, the journey times down to London from North Wales. Secondly, Wales has anyway received... How's it going to do that? Because, because any passenger from North Wales will be able to uh, go to the interchange at Crewe and get down to London more quickly, okay. so there's, no, there's never been any doubt about that. I agree that, that in South Wales it's... Uh, that the it's all going to go across into England, is it? Well, yes, of course, but I mean that is the nature of, um, of rail travel. I mean, we, we benefited Why hugely can't from the electrification. We have a link between on, North I, mean, and South Wales. I want to get back to roads in a minute. So basically, the, the answer to your question is: we are, in any case, spending hundreds of millions of pounds on rail infrastructure in Wales. We've had the benefits of the electrification of the 
uh, the South Wales line. We've had the benefits of, of uh, the work that's taking place in the Forest of Dean, which is making it quicker anyway to get up to North Wales. We've got various rail projects taking place in Wales. £300 million has been spent, I think, in, in, the, in, in the last control period on rail projects. Um, and the, and uh, on top of that, we've got the, uh, the metro system, which is going to be built partly using UK government money uh, around South Wales. So, I mean, that, that, that's the, the rail question. Let's go back to roads, OK? Wasn't the actually question his was, question, though, because his well, question was that Scotland, because of something well, I think, on the Barnet consequential, which with we won't all, get into, but respect, Scotland is going to get money for HS2 and Wales is not. Yeah. Well, actually, the, the overall budget for transport going up in England does mean that, uh, that, we're, that Wales gets more. But let's go back to the original question, because I still but haven't not had a chance to answer not The question not was, is, is the government's decision, the Welsh government's, Labour government's decision to stop building roads... And it is all major road building projects. I mean, that, that's what it says on the tin. And to be fair to them, that's what they're going to do. For once, they are going to deliver exactly what they said. Is that going to harm the economy? Of course it's going to harm the economy if we haven't got any roads being built. And not only that, but there has been hundreds of millions of pounds spent developing plans for the roads, which are now no longer going to be built. £150 million pounds was spent developing <coughs> the plans for the M4 relief road, and it's not going to get built. And not only that, but Thangham says, well, some people want to breathe clean air. Yes, we would. And from San Beda, where, uh, uh, where Liz uh, lives, down to Chepster, where I live, and along the M4, we're not going to be breathing clean air because we're all stuck in traffic jams because the Welsh Government won't build any more roads and they won't give us buses either. OK, let's hear, let's hear this, from our audience. This is the blueprint. This is all the right. blueprint for what Labour want to do if they get elected well, at the next election. Well, we've got an audience here from Wales, so let's hear what they think. The woman here in the grey and black cardi. Uh... HS2, you mentioned the benefit as being people from North Wales being able to get to London. Mm -hmm. I'm rather more interested in how I get around Wales. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Man at the back there in the dark orange sweater. Yeah. Yes, you, sir. No. I'd like to know where the money that is allegedly going to be saved is going to go. Is it going to go towards the 90 million that is allegedly also going to be spent on an additional uh, large um, assembly? OK. I'm not sure we have anyone... Well, Liz, maybe you might know about that. The, the woman in the blue and white stripy top at the very back. I wonder how much of the decision is actually altruistic for the environment, but more a case of losing all the EU benefits that have gone to fund majority of the roads that have already been built in Wales. OK. <laughs> the lack of money, I say. Man there, with the white shirt, yes. Um, I think it's easy for the Conservatives to point out that Labour could not do something and damage the Welsh economy. But what about what the Conservatives are doing and how they're damaging the entire UK <laughs> economy with that? OK. And the woman here. Yeah, so I think the Welsh Government uh, transport strategy is a total disaster. I mean, it was mentioned the amount of money that's spent on Cardiff Airport, for argument's sake, and somebody said there is flights, there's a handful of flights a day. Uh, the major road which are being cancelled, this is going to harm the economy and tourism. We can't go around Wales. I, think all the wrong decisions are being made and £50 million of the levelling up funds is being spent on the link between Cardiff and Cardiff Bay, whereby yeah. already <laughs> that link exists. Link. So that's a waste of <laughs> money. Okay. And are you, let me just ask you, are you swayed at all by the argument that if you build more roads you get more cars? I you think know, we... as night follows day you get more pollution, we've got to think about the climate. Absolutely. If we had uh, at least a decent transport system, the environment is really, really okay. important, but we don't. We can't go around, you know, Wales. OK. So, Reiki, local girl, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I am local, and I think that my first job was in Mould, and I remember being in the, the passenger seat of a car and that journey. I, oh, goodness <laughs> me. Um, <laughs> Um, but I and I I love public transport as well. I am I'm I'm a train. I'm a bus girl. You know I'm a, I'm a local bus a local buses all the time and 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 coaches as well. You know when I was um, filming the pact, the other exec producers got very annoyed because I would get the three a.m. train from Sophia Gardens and I'd be in my kitchen in Greenwich at half past six and uh, on on a, a National Express coach. So I like public transport. Um, and I think it's great that Labour are thinking um, about um, the environment. Although I, I do, because I kind of, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a cynic, I guess. And so I always think that maybe, maybe they, did they decide to scrap the roads and then find a reason for it? 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and the environment is a really good one. I'm, I'm just really cynical by that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, for me, it's, it's, you, can't, you can't get around the country on, on, on any transport easily, actually, whether it's your own car or a train. Or, and that, it, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that you can't get on a train from Cardiff and go right to the north. It just doesn't make any sense. Anita. The fact that the Labour Party on this panel won't even defend this policy tells you how bad an idea it really is. And the reality of the situation is that, we, you know, it, it's an, an idea to nowhere. It has, it has, it's run out of road. It needs to go. And it's very, very clear. This idea, it, it seems like something out of the thick of it, really. Um, you know, guys, you know what we're going to do? We need to tackle climate change, so no roads. Everybody walk. That's not and we don't do. have, we do not have well, the kind of public transport that you should all rightly expect. And I think Cardiff is reasonably good for public transport. Once you get out of there, I've been to Clandidno, Clanetli, all yep. these places where you just cannot get around except by car and unless you focus on that problem <laughs> the fact remains that the world government is only funding um, the emergency bus support for the next three months so what are people supposed to do outside of that there really hasn't been of course we need to be ambitious for climate change but let's let's walk before we run right let's focus on the issues of people uh, uh, outlining right now around infrastructure, around investment, around tourism. These are real world consequences. And yes, we should think about 2050, but let's think about the next 550 days okay. when people are going to need to be able to get around on buses and on better public transport. question was about whether it's going to wreck the economy and I think it's a bit rich for David Davis who supported Liz Truss whose budget whose disastrous budget last year crashed the talk economy about, has put up mortgages mortgages for people in this room their mortgage will have gone up whilst they were watching that announcement nice. people whose rent has gone up we had to prop the pound at the Bank of England had to intervene to prop up the pound to save people's pensions it's a bit rich when you have been starving the nations of yeah. You have put up taxes over the course of the last 13 years, so this is the highest taxed UK for 70 years. We've had stagnant growth, we've had low investment, and now you want to criticise a Welsh government decision? This is extraordinary. Well, if you... This is a Tory government <laughs> who has crashed the economy at the expense of everybody in this room. Well, nice... Uh... <laughs> No, Briefly, because nice we're nearly nice out of time. For your supporters, um, Thang, a bit right here in Wales, you've left us with the longest hospital waiting list in the whole of the United Kingdom, the worst educational outcomes in the United Kingdom, an economy minister who's admitted that he doesn't know how to run the economy, no roads being built, £100 million being spent on a whole load of extra Welsh Assembly members, and you're even trying to ban meal deals at 350 Nobody's going to be allowed to go out and get a meal deal <laughs> unless... Unless they're amongst the extra assembly members, he'll be able to have a full slap up English breakfast for three pounds fifty in the Senate. You're an absolute disgrace, and this is what's in store for us if Labour get elected. Right. Yes, we've only got about a minute left. Let's hear from our audience. Yes, the man there in the white and blue top. Um, rural communities almost have to travel by car, so if you're going to get rid of um, major roads, then you've got to increase spending on um, public transport, trains and buses yep. in rural communities. Mm -hmm. And if the Welsh Government aren't going to do that, then that's fine, but you need to increase um, major roads. OK. Down there in the green top. Uh, I think there's been a huge lack of consideration towards the electrification of, uh, elect of car transport. So clo not yep. um, invest in roads just means that there won't be roads in the future for the electric yep. cars to go on, so it's just very short-sighted. Which is why it would help if the Tories would invest in renewable energy and in the okay. electric cars. Man here. But we are doing. I think it's particularly rich of the, the representative from Labour to turn the question around when she won't answer the original question in the first place. <laughs> That's the thing, and I gave you, I gave you a good go there. I hope, you, hope you'll agree. I do. Our time is up. I think we could have talked about roads for a whole hour, <laughs> but I'm thinking maybe everyone else, everywhere else in the UK might be glad that we didn't, but it's clearly a very, very hot and passionate topic here in Wales, so I'm glad, glad we got to it. Our hour is up. Thank you very much to everyone involved. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much to the audience for coming along and being part of the programme and putting all your points of view. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. Remember, we are in Sunderland next week. Go to the BBC website if you want to come and be part of the audience. And, of course, as well as being on BBC One, we are live every week on the iPlayer at 8 o'clock, so you can watch us then as well if 10.45 is too late for you past your bedtime. Thanks very much for watching from everyone here. Bye-bye.